Hello, and welcome to 20 Minute Health Talk. I'm your host, Rob Hoyle. Endometriosis affects one in 10 women, yet diagnosis takes an average of 10 years from the onset of symptoms, which can be debilitating and life altering. Even with a proper diagnosis, women face many obstacles from medical gaslighting to limited treatment options to infertility. Two of our guests have spent seven years trying to find better treatments and less invasive ways to detect endometriosis through the ROSE study, which stands for Research Outsmarts Endometriosis. Dr. Christine Metz is co-founder of the study and a professor in the Institute of Molecular Medicine at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research. Welcome, Dr. Metz. Thanks for having us. I'm really excited to be here today. Dr. Peter Gregerson is also co-director of the Rose Study and director of the Feinstein's Robert S. Boaz Center for Genomics and Human Genetics. Dr. Gregerson, welcome. Great to be here. And we have April Summerford, an endometriosis patient and Rose Study participant who also runs the popular support group Beyond Endo and hosts the Fem Future podcast, which covers women's health. She joins us remotely from California. April, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Dr. Metz, let's start by defining endometriosis. Sure. Endometriosis is characterized by the growth of endometrial tissue that normally lines the uterus, growing outside of the uterus, typically in the pelvic cavity. It will usually grow on or around the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, and can cause debilitating pain. And of course, it could lead to infertility. We'll talk more about the Rose study in a minute. But first, April, a big frustration for endo patients is the delay between onset of symptoms and diagnosis. How long did it take for you to get a proper diagnosis? And what obstacles did you face along the way? Yeah, it took over a decade for me. Um, And even then, it was even more, several more years before I got proper treatment of the disease and really understood what was going on and and how to deal with it. Um, Pain is normal for women. Unfortunately, that's still a stigma that exists in medicine. So getting through that obstacle and then several obstacles along the way to even get proper treatment. So I had a diagnostic surgery, which eventually did give me at least the diagnosis, which was very helpful, but it did not give me proper treatment. So the doctor was using an outdated method that's still used, unfortunately, in OBGYN's offices called um, burning or cutlery surgery. He used a cutlery iron. And so that was a huge obstacle to my healing. I wasn't able to get better. I got sicker after that surgery and then spent several more years trying to figure out how to reform my lifestyle, how to work on my diet and all those things. And then eventually found a wide excision surgery. And that really sent me all the way into remission. And I was able to actually function in my life after that point. Wow. Tell us how you got involved in the Rose study. Yeah, I actually was, uh, fortunately I've heard about it for quite a while, but I didn't know they were still actively recruiting participants. So I heard about it from a, I think a New York times article that they were still actively recruiting. And so I was more than happy to join anything I can do to help future generations of endo warriors not go through what I went through. Um, I'm all on board. Dr. Gregerson, given how common this is, 10% of, of, of women have endo, why aren't there more treatments and how is the Rose study helping to address that? Well, part of the reason there are no, I mean, there is one treatment that involves uh, manipulating hormones that is basically blocking estrogen, putting people in, into menopause. And it has been shown to be helpful for pain, but it does nothing for the progression of the disease. So, I mean, it is an estrogen dependent disease, but most of the research that has been done has not really figured out exactly what is going on. And so then it's hard to come up with a therapy if you don't know what's going on. Right. Um, gender bias is such a big issue. Why is that? I, I look at the data. There's so many studies for men, but so little for women. Why, why, how does that impact uh, you know, research for endometriosis? I, I think part of the problem here is a lack of funding for women's health. And um, that comes from a lack of research, which of course leads to a lack of funding and it's a vicious cycle. And um, I guess maybe 50 years ago, there were fewer women in science and medicine, you know, geared toward looking at women's health issues. And although we have caught up in the professions, there's still a lack of Um, I would think overall interest and funding, which really drives research in particular areas. Without the funding, it's very difficult to go forward and continue doing the research. 
Yeah. A big focus uh, of the study surrounds menstrual blood. Tell us uh, why this is significant and what role it can play. Well, uh, when Christine and I came up with the idea of studying menstrual blood in detail, uh, most people thought we were crazy, uh, including <laughs> including our recruitment nurse, nursing team. Uh, but there, is, there has been a model out there for o- almost 100 years that uh, part of what starts endometriosis and may promote it and propagate it is that there is retrograde menstruation, that is, Rather than the menstrual blood or menstrual fluid coming out completely on out the vaginal tract, it can go backwards up the fallopian tube and deposit itself into the abdominal cavity. And actually, that basically happens during every cycle in virtually every woman. But for some reason, about 10% of women, that material deposits and grows in the peritoneal cavity. So we thought about... Well, when we were thinking about cause, we thought um, there was a lot of thoughts about the immune response and how it doesn't handle this well, or there's something different about the lining of the abdomen. But we thought that the, probably the money is in what's different in the menstrual blood compared in people with endometriosis versus normal. And that's turned out to be really the case. <laughs> yeah. right. and, to, and to add to that... There have been many scientific discoveries demonstrating that the endometrium of women with and without endometriosis actually is different. So regardless of whether there even was retrograde menstruation, at least from a diagnostic purpose, people have shown defects in the endometrium in women with endometriosis compared to healthy controls. And most of that is related to inflammation. Dr. Gregerson, tell us what we're learning so far from the study. So what we've done uh, in the last year is apply a very new technique uh, known as single cell RNA sequencing, where basically you can take all the cells that come out of the menstrual blood and characterize each one individually for many thousands of genes. And what that has shown us is that the cells that are present in menstrual blood of people with endometriosis are extraordinarily different. There's a cell called a stromal cell, which we have have shown previously has a lot of abnormal functions is clearly very different and may be in a state in which it they sort of promote inflammation and fibrosis that's one and there's another cell called a uterine nk cell which many people believe is important for cleaning up the bad stromal cells and those cells are dramatically reduced in people with endometriosis, like fourfold reduced in number. And <clears throat> that's an observation that we actually made, you know, four years ago, just using free cells in menstrual effluent. But the, the, when you actually look at the tissues, the, the differences are truly dramatic. So that we, we have, we have a paper that is likely to be published shortly to document that. And uh, that alone, the numbers of those cells may well be part of the ultimate diagnostic. That's yeah, awesome. I'd, I'd like to add that those uterine and case cells that are lower in number in the endometriosis patients are clearly linked to fertility. Yeah. So we think that there is another key there that we're going to be able to explore and everyone else will be able to explore once this information is published. It's very exciting. Very exciting. Tell us a little bit uh, about the the relationship, the correlation with endometriosis and infertility. So about, I don't know, I would say, you know, 30, 40% between 25 to 40% are the republished Um, information of women with infertility who have endo and about 25% of women with endo have infertility. Um, Some women don't realize there's something called silent endo. So not, it's it's a difficult disease in, in many ways. And one of the ways that it's difficult is that severity of symptoms doesn't always correlate with the severity of the disease. So women could have absolutely no pain and have very severe disease. And what they call that is silent endometriosis. And many of those women get diagnosed when they have tried to have children for several years and have been um, not able to do so. And so in those women, a lot of the damage is done. So these lesions grow on the reproductive organs and they kind of wreak havoc for them to have children. 
And excision surgery, such as what um, April just underwent, is something that really does help those women uh, improve their fertility and preserve their fertility. And IVF treatments are very successful in women who have undergone that surgery and have had endometriosis. Yeah. April, do you want to talk a little bit about your journey uh, in trying to, to become a mom? Yeah, I've been on a long one. <laughs> so um, I have been married for 15 years. And for most of those years, I think about uh, 13 of them, my husband and I have been trying for kids and it has not happened. So I've tried everything out of the sun and I've done several different procedures. It wasn't until I found out about white excision, though, that I knew that my statistic of, you know, conceiving went up. So like there's hard literature that if you have a white excision surgery properly, that your options for fertility increase as everything else decreases your options as you get older. Um, and my fertility doc that's been treating me this whole time after white excision surgery even told me that I anti-aged and that my ovaries looked better than he's ever seen them. And oh, that's yeah, even though I'm yeah. older. Right, right. So it was really a positive <laughs> confirmation that things are headed in the right direction for me. Um, I recently finished an IVF cycle. It was much easier than the last time I've done one uh, pre white excision surgery. So it does make a big difference in fertility. I'm hoping for the best. Now we have some little embry embryos on ice. <laughs> so I'm hoping uh, for the best option this time around, but the fertility part of this can be just as traumatic as, you know, everything else. Yeah, and yeah. it's interesting because I think it's actually 40, even a little bit higher than 40% of women with infertility have endo, but we're still educating doctors in that field too, that they need to be looking for endometriosis as a cause of infertility if all other factors have been rolled out. Yeah. April, I think what you're doing is so amazing because I think what you're, you're doing is you're giving hope to people. Your support group uh, has been able to raise so much awareness. Tell us about that support group that you run and how it's kind of making a difference, you know, in, in bringing more awareness and getting to studies like the Rose study. Yeah, during, during the pandemic, I realized that there was going to be a huge gap in care for women. There's already a big gap in care for endometriosis. And then we obviously had to shut down all of our healthcare systems. So I started my support group as a way of kind of closing the gap and letting women have a place to vent, find answers, take care of themselves, support one another. And so that's just turned into this really great thriving community of women who um, have a, pl a safe place where they can share whatever's going on. It's like, we, we say there's no such thing as TMI. You can share whatever. And then we're able to help one another through the process because really the only, like the most terrible thing about this condition is the excruciating pain. But the only second worst thing is that there's really not a good outlet or a place to go to find answers quickly. So my group has been, I think, you know, if you ask the women in there, it's been a really good place for them to hang out, find answers and support one another through really difficult times. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I you know, I just want to say, April, that it's so important that people like you are participating in the study because it really drives our research forward. And we are really driven by interactions with our participants and their needs and frustrations and have thought about developing the diagnostic and better understanding this disease to come up with new therapies really based on what our participants have shared with us yeah. and their frustrations. It really drives us every day. Yeah. Yeah. And I would assume that in a research study like this, the more participants, the better. And from what I understand, you're also starting to enroll younger women into this study, which I think could be helpful. Yeah. So we are IRB approved for human subjects research to enroll 12 year olds and above and are working with a couple of adolescent gynecologists to recruit those subjects. We feel that they have a lot to benefit. And I think earlier identification and earlier treatments would really benefit people. And what's really sad about this is that we don't even know whether that would be the case because there haven't been any studies that identified endometriosis at an early time point in order to test whether early progestin therapy actually does anything to halt the disease or change the progression of the disease. We know now that none of the hormone-based therapies change the progression of disease in adult women, but we don't know whether if a teen started at a younger age, whether you could actually change their trajectory or not. Yeah. And I think what's so great about this, we're talking to April and she's on the other coast. She's in, in California. The Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research is in on Long Island in New York, but you don't have to be in New York to be part of the study. Nope. Nope. Anybody can join 
from across the United States or Canada, anywhere in North America, actually. And they can Google rose and endometriosis, and it will come up as the first hit online. <laughs> uh, and they can learn more about the study through that portal and join the study there. April, what's it like for you seeing so many women get involved in this study from all over uh, the country and, you know, and Canada and, you know, bringing us hopefully one step closer to, to finding a solution? Well, it's everything I wanted recently, uh, because one of the biggest challenges in my you know, community and with women is that they, a lot of people don't know if they have endo, they mm -hmm. have severe symptoms, they have infertility, there's a lot going on, but they don't actually know if they have endo or not. And there's a huge gap between, you know, if you think you have this problem and actual diagnosis, which if you think about it is surgery. And that's even for me, mind boggling when I was told that the first time, and it still is when I tell women, well, you know, you think you have a problem where else in the world you say, I think I have a problem. It's like, well, we have to cut you open to know for sure. It's like, that's a really hard leap for women. So I can't wait to have a non-diagnostic, I say painless, you know, diagnostic test that would tell them, you know, with some confidence, if they need to go further with their journey and see what's going on, they would feel a lot better if they knew, you know, this test says actually I do have markers. I should investigate this further versus, you know, I don't really want it. Like a lot of women say, I don't really want a surgery. So then they don't really know what's happening. Yeah. So what are some of the most common symptoms that patients face? Pain is a big one. So chronic pelvic pain, 70% of women with endometriosis have chronic pelvic pain. There's also pain during different parts of the cycle, not necessarily just with menstruation. There could be pain going to the bathroom and there could be pain during intercourse. So all sorts of chronic pain issues, as well as nausea, bloating, and I think, you know, very commonly experienced are things like missing activities of life, yeah. uh, staying home from school once a month, staying home from work once a month, not going to the school prom because you have your period, um, the being on an athletic team, sure. not being able to play once a month. They're very debilitating um, for people. Right. Very debilitating physical pain that has a ripple effect that could become emotional and, and mental pain. Right. And because this disease has a genetic component, we often find that people kind of get bad advice from their mothers or their aunts or their sisters saying, this is normal. This is what I had. Right. This is normal for you to stay in bed once a month. It is not normal to be in bed with period pain once a month for anybody. Nobody can feel somebody else's pain. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one thing about this disease is um, that it is estrogen dependent and it's known that estrogen can intensify the sensitivity of pain. So these women have increased sensitivity to pain on top of the pain that they're experiencing. I think it's just a challenge for people to get diagnosed, particularly teens who don't want surgical scars on their tummies when they want to wear bikinis during the summer, <laughs> right? I mean, that's a barrier. And also their mothers and fathers do not necessarily want them having surgery at such a young age as well. Um, the Rose study actually does recruit women who are healthy controls and have no symptoms of endometriosis, as well as people who are fully pathologically diagnosed with endometriosis and have a pathology report to prove that they have endo. But we also enroll women who are symptomatic and are thinking about becoming diagnosed. And it's interesting that that group has been a very gr large growing group in our study. Yeah. And what's really frustrating is that we find very few of the women actually go on to laparoscopic surgery. And I get different answers from different people. Some people say they're not encouraged to go on for surgery, that a presumed diagnosis is okay and they'll get treated. And then there's other women who say, I've been begging my doctors to refer me to somebody who will do the diagnostic surgery. There's so little study done on this, but one in 10 women have it. Yeah. So that means everybody knows at least a few people that have endometriosis. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. I mean, this problem of an, I mean, what we're really focusing on now is developing this test in the setting of people who are symptomatic and are going to be confirmed at, at laparoscopy, because that's the way to get this approved by the FDA as a test. Uh, you know, the data we have now is 
very striking that people with endometriosis versus controls is very different uh, appearance of the menstrual effluent. But to show it in somebody who's symptomatic, who then goes on and has it actually documented at laparoscopy is actually a very key step for us. And that's what we're really focused on now. And it's, it's been great, and we've been very lucky to be at the Feinstein Institutes at Northwell Health because Northwell has really been giving us a lot of financial support to develop this non-invasive diagnostic. And I'm not sure we'd be so lucky if we were somewhere else. We always like to end on 20-minute health talk uh, on a positive note. So I'll ask each one of you, uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Gregerson, what gives you hope? What gives you optimism going forward? Well, I think the thing that w may makes us most excited is that what we are seeing in menstrual blood suggests a lot of different therapies, both therapies to prevent uh, endometriosis for those at risk, as well as treatment. So, and some of those therapies are not toxic. Um, so I'm pretty enthusiastic that we're going to come up with not only a diagnostic, but a way of uh, at least preventing, if not treating, existing endometriosis. Awesome. April, what gives you hope? What gives you optimism? Well, this whole study is giving me a ton of optimism because I've been looking for years for a more innovative approach to endometriosis and the Rose study is finally, uh, you know, at, at approaching it that way. Um, and there's so many other things too. You know, we have the rise of femtech. We're starting to learn so much about our bodies mm, just within mm. our own hands, which is great. I think things like the research at Rose study combined with femtech combined with some of these other advances is going to give women of the future just a far better experience as far as, you know, easily getting diagnosed, hopefully very easily getting treatment as opposed to these 10, 20, I've met women 30 year, you know, delays in diagnosis and treatment. It's just, it's wreaking havoc on their lives. So all of these things combined is giving me hope for a much better future for women. Awesome. Dr. Metz. I, I guess I'm a nerdy scientist and I'll say that what gives me hope is our recent data and some of the data in the literature that supports our strategy for developing an early screening or diagnostic tool that will get women and young girls who are suffering with this disease to treatment much earlier and less invasively. And that's what gets me, you know, going every day is finalizing that diagnostic or that yeah. screening tool so we can get it to these people who need it so desperately. And you said you called yourself a nerdy scientist. I think you guys are rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Dr. Metz, Dr. Gregerson, April, thank you so much for joining us here on 20 Minute Health Talk. And for you, the listener, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Rob Hoyle. Have a great day and stay safe. Get more expert insight from some of the leading voices in healthcare today. Subscribe to 20 Minute Health Talk on Podbean, Pandora, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts.